Sir, I have a quick question, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I was just wondering, um, so the PDF um, uh, for the reading assignment, uh, for me, like, uh, there wasn't really an option to convert it to a Google Doc, so I wasn't able to, like, type my questions uh, in it. So should I just submit, a, like, a, a Google Doc with just that information, just the questions, and then how many should I ask? It would be fine to just submit um, a Google Doc or a Word Doc. I think you can probably also just type the questions in. Um, whatever you're more comfortable with, I think is fine. There's no reason to work too hard to try to convert the PDF into anything you can actually interact with. It's just a summary. So when you have questions, just keep a record of them. Um, and, and how many questions should we ask for, for the? Um, probably no more than four or five. Um, you know, so there's usually an upper limit that I'd like to impose. I, there's no real lower limit, I guess. Suppose you read the, I mean, there's, there's also the possibility, um, you know, there's also the possibility that if you read that summary, you won't have any questions at all. Um, you know, so if it turns out that you don't, um, you just might want to make a note of something that you find interesting about the summary. Um, but most people, when they're reading things like, like this, they're going to have questions about, um, you know, maybe what it is we're actually doing, um, you know, what kind of, what kind of assumptions do the does the analysis that we're doing depend on that kind of thing? Um, you know, if you have those, that's fine. Um, if you totally understand what's going on in chapter 18 and there's nothing that's ambiguous in the slightest, you get it all. It's okay to write that. Um, maybe make a couple of notes that you think are interesting about the chapter, just to sort of indicate that you've engaged with the material a little bit. Um, if you understand everything, you might want to think a little bit about what chapter 18 has to do with chapter 16 and 17. Um, so, you know, that's a, it's a pretty good question, you know, like where, what, what sort of is the common, what's the common thread that wants to link all of these things together? Um, you know, you might want to think a little bit about what that is. If, if other, if the methods themselves are, 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 if you get those, then think about maybe the common things which kind of link these together. Does that make yeah, sense? No. Thank you. Does, does anyone have any other questions about the reading assignment or the work at all for this week? Anything you can, I mean, it's fine to ask right now. We, you might as well, um, it's at the beginning of class, it's okay to ask. Okay, I mean, if you don't, that's okay too. Um, so to kind of continue, you know, the pattern of the class that we've established, I guess, over the past few weeks, I'll just indicate a few things, just a few reminders. Um, the reading assignment that we're discussing is due this Friday, so do your best to read the material, engage with it a bit. Um, think of questions that you might have if things are opaque. Um, one thing that you might want to think of, whether or not you have questions, is the sort of thing that wants to link chapter 18 to chapter 16 and 17. So the, the thing in a course, I think from the perspective of the student, it's probably, you know, if you're seeing this for the first time, trying to, trying to wrestle with the material, um, it might be it might be a little weird to see something like 16 and 17 and then 18 you know it might look in 18 like you're doing something that's you know totally different than what's going on in chapters 16 and 17 of the text that turns out that's not true um and you know there's a very particular thing that is sort of you know i guess I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the right word for it it's not capstone because i guess that indicates something you kind of do at the end of um at the end of studying something so i guess that's not the right word but that's kind of what i want to say it's the thing that's important for us over the past few weeks, over the last few weeks of the course. You know, what, what major technical tool is kind of appearing behind the scenes over and over and over again as we attempt to do inference? Um, if you can read 18 and read 16 and 17 and figure that out, um, it'd probably be worth just thinking about making a note of it, maybe trying to make, 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 those, make the sense of the tool that you're talking about precise if you can, if you can do that. Um, so other thing, other things that are due, or you know, the things that you sort of expect. There's a there's a homework on my stat lab due on Monday. I believe that's homework ten, um, which covers chapter eighteen. So it's due at the normal time at five p.m. Um, there's a reading assignment seven that's due on Tuesday, so that's also not unexpected. Reading assignment has to do with inference. Um, I tried to make some notes in the rubric, maybe about what to write down. Um, when people turned in this reading assignment last semester, there were some, there were some confusions, you know, about what, what you might want to write down when you're thinking about the assignment. So if you have questions about what they, 
what the form of the answer should be. I guess if that makes sense, don't hesitate to ask between now and Tuesday. Um, so I think that's where we are, where, where we are right now. Um, I haven't checked to today to see how many people have completed homework nine. Um, there was an extension until 5 p.m. today because of the issues associated to my stat lab. I'm not entirely sure that those issues have been totally resolved, so I haven't checked. If you're still having some issues completing that homework, please let me know. Um, it's no problem extending it. I want I mean, it's more important. It's more important that it be done than um, that it be done by any particular time. Um, so, you know, if you haven't if you haven't completed it, please do so in the next few hours. And if you can't complete it for technical reasons, please let me know. So, you know, with that in mind. Um, with all that in mind, you know, there's, there's a little bit to do, a little bit to read, um, talking about inference. Um, I want to go back, think a little bit more about what we're doing this week um, and what we'll be doing over the next few weeks. Um, we started a particular problem. Um, I mean, again, I don't know at the beginning of classes if people particularly need, you know, a, a summary of everything we've done up to this point. But remember that we're talking about the null hypothesis significance testing framework. And in such a situation, we are checking to see whether or not the study we're doing, you know, conforms to some basic, um, you know, to some basic conditions. And the, the conditions that we're talking about are the conditions that are needed to make sure that the sampling distribution of the statistic of the estimator has a certain shape. If those conditions aren't satisfied, then sometimes you have to kind of approach the material with, with with a bit of care, with a, you have to approach the result with a bit of care because um, if the sampling distribution of the statistic is not normal or doesn't have that nice normal shape, then a lot of the formulas that we might use have, have very deep problems. And you know, if, if, the, if the disagreements between reality and the conditions are drastic enough, then you know, you can't really take, you know, you can't really take the mathematical results that seriously. So you should always make sure that the conditions, you know, are reasonably satisfied under, you know, just read through them, think about whether or not you think they're satisfied. Um, the one that probably is the easiest to recognize where there's a problem is the so-called success failure condition if you're dealing with the sample proportion or if you're dealing with the sample mean. If the sample size is too small and if the population is not known to be normal, there could be issues there as well. So those are the sorts of, those are the sorts of violations which are pretty easy to check. Um, one condition that's usually pretty evident is the 10% condition. It's pretty unlikely that you're ever going to be looking at anything where the sample is over 10% of the population in size. The one condition that's a little hard to, harder to check where there probably isn't as good of a mathematical remediation is this sort of independence condition um, where you're trying to make sure that internally the samples are, are, in, are somehow, the elements of the sample are independent as you're choosing them. Um, the randomness condition is, is, is sort of related to this. Um, it's really hard to make sense of, it's, it's hard to make sense mathematically of, of the situation where, you know, if you're in the position where the sample that you're dealing with is not a simple random sample. If you think it's a convenient sample, then again, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that you might think to do in this situation won't, won't work all that well. Um, you might have to resolve to different sorts of simulated results using a computer to try to develop some estimates or to do some inference. Um, but, you know, at this point, I think it's just fair to say that you would probably caution anyone that you're reporting the information to that, you know, there's some question about the randomization condition. You feel bad about it. Um, you feel like maybe it's not satisfied in certain situations. Um, but some of that has to do, you know, some of this has to do with like reading what people did to try to see whether or not it's plausible. What's going on everything that you got? Did you have a oh, question? Me. Oh, sorry. Right. Okay. Um, so that's kind of where we are right now. Um, you know, we were sort of, we sort of stopped at a particular problem. The handout we were working on last time um, was, was this one. Um, I think before, um, before, hang on, just one second. You know, be before um, I get too deep into it, I want to, you know, say a couple of more things about the methods. You know, we'll kind of go back and think about how to how to how to deal with this, the, the latter half of this problem. Um, in chapter eighteen, the author focuses um, on on I guess what I'd like to call standardized 
statistics. And by standardize, um, it's, it's just a word which suggests that we want to look at something that is like a z-score. So you'll, you'll go back, you'll remember, in, I guess it was written assignment four when we were talking about the coin. A lot of people's intuition about that coin problem, I think, was quite good. Um, remember in that problem, um, we were thinking a little bit about what, what the distribution of possible outcomes should be if the coin was fair. So a lot of people recommended that we examine the gap between, you know, what happened when we actually flipped the coin and, you know, what would be true if the coin is fair. That's kind of what the author wants to talk about here. When the author is talking about standardized statistics, the author is talking about statistics which have been translated around math in a mathematical sense in such a way so that their mean is zero and their standard deviation is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something which, you know, is either one or something else related to the t distribution. So when you're thinking about standardized statistics, I guess maybe more practically, the author wants to focus on either one of the two following formulas. So for proportions, the author is considering a formula which looks like p hat minus p divided by the square root uh, p times one minus p divided by n. Now, remember in the context of this type of problem, we're usually, you know, I guess what I'd write is the null hypothesis typically this type of problem um, requires an assumption about P. And for means, so there's one more thing I should say about these, so I'll try to do it all at once. Um, for means, the author is usually thinking about the following standardized statistic, um, X bar minus some assumed value from U divided by S divided by the square root of N in the denominator, where S is the sample standard deviation. So here again, H naught, the, the, the null hypothesis um, you know, is, uh, you know, is going to say something or says something. About mu. So you're typically assuming that it's some number. Um, S is sample standard deviation. Um, you know, that's the formula. And so in this case, if you're dealing with proportions, this standardized statistic that you're considering is normally is normally distributed with mean zero and standard deviation one. If you assume that there's some value of P, if you make some assumption about the value of P that you're gonna use, those P's are all numbers, the sample size is some number. The only thing that can vary in this formula is the value of P hat, and it can only vary with a simple random sample. So you're dealing with just a translation of a normal distribution. What's a little tricky about the analysis is this guy right here, because if you don't know the population standard deviation, and that's pretty common, then in this quotient, both X bar and S are things that vary with the random sample and that it increases the variability in the result. So these are T distributed with degrees of freedom in minus one. So this is the sort of framework we're using. And so if we're in this situation to classify, you know, to classify a result as extreme Um, not compatible with the model in, in some sense. You need to know, or you need to decide um, the significance level alpha. So, you know, that in, in a way encodes the idea of, of an extreme value in the tail, one of these two distributions. Um, and you need to calculate the value of um, the appropriate standardized statistic. Um, now I think at some point people get tired of writing down, you know, standardized or they get, get it confused a bit. So what, what people usually do is not, they don't really call it standardized, they call it the test statistic. Um, that's maybe the name that's more commonly used. And, and then um, when you know these two things, 
you can classify the result, and classify the evidence. Now, the evidence will come, you know, the evidence will suggest one of two things. Either you can reject the null at um, the level of significance alpha or or you can fail to reject the null hypothesis at level of significance alpha. So, you know, in, in maybe a simpler language, um, you know, these two things that can happen, you're, you're just trying to figure out whether or not you're dealing with an experimental result, which is extreme enough to cast doubt on the null. Um, you know, is, is the data compatible in some way with the mathematical model that you're using under the null hypothesis? And the significance level sort of is a tolerance. Um, it, it, allow, it sort of is encoding where the extreme results actually are together with the alternative. And, you know, once you're able to say something about whether or not the result that you actually got falls into an extreme range or not, then you're able to say something about your beliefs about the null hypothesis. Um, other things to say about this, you know, there's lots of things that you could potentially write. If you reject the null, sometimes you can say that there's statistically significant evidence of a difference. Um, statistically significant evidence that, you know, something has increased. Those words are often used when you're, um, when you're, when you're talking about this type of framework. So, you know, the framework is procedurally complex, um, but it's again helpful to remember that in the cases that we're dealing with, we really only have two different types of distributions for our test statistics to consider. And both of those distributions want to say something about, you know, whether or not the experimental result is extreme. Are there any questions about this so far? That's really all we're saying. Yes, Abby. Um, so just a quick question. So I know that we were talking about alpha yesterday, but in this, um, just, I guess, to clarify, so in this kind of a scenario, would alpha refer to the confidence interval or the level of confidence, so like 0.99 or something like that? They are related. You're not wrong to point this out. So the level of confidence, so there's a relationship between confidence interval construction and the sort of inference we're doing here, right, with the alpha. It turns out that, you know, um, they're, they're kind of equivalent, actually. Um, when you talk about the level of significance, the confidence level is typically one minus the level of significance for a two-sided test. So if you're trying to test for a difference, your extreme values will come in the tails. So it is, it is exactly the same. So if you're trying to figure out whether or not you, you, you're looking at you know, an, a null hypothesis significance test at alpha equal to 0.01 in those circumstances, it turns out this is exactly equivalent to, to calculating a 99% confidence interval. So one minus the level of alpha is the confidence level for the appropriate confidence interval construction. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you so much. They're definitely related. The, the relationship is less clear when you're dealing with a one-sided significance test. Um, you know, so there, there's, a, there's, there's kind of a correction you make for that when you divide something in half. Now, some of those issues that you that you might want to talk about with the relationship between the alpha level and the confidence level, we'll sort out maybe in more detail next week. Um, you know, there, there, there are things to say about at least the procedural relationship between these two acts, the act of computing a confidence interval, the act of doing a significance test. They're definitely related. And alpha and the confidence level also have the relationship that you might expect, that you might be guessing, um, you know, 0.01 and 0.99. Um, are, are indeed related. 0.05, 95%, these are related, but it's one minus the alpha level. That's the confidence level for the appropriate calculation of confidence interval. So do you have, anyone have any other, other questions so far? I mean, again, what we're talking about is fairly, fairly abstract. Um, I'd, like it to I'd like to make it a bit more concrete um, by going back to the example and sort of thinking it through um, you know, I also need to talk about the idea of a p-value, um, sort of equivalent to what we're saying right here, but there's kind of a lot going on. So um, we were thinking about this example last time on, on Monday. So you might remember it, it's, it's a question about long jumps. 
And we were thinking about means and the basic question is like, where's the mean, right? Has, has the person improved? Well, okay, I guess like if you're thinking about B, some of the conditions where you, know, you're, you think that the, that the sampling distribution might be normal might be in some slight violation. The randomness condition, as I wrote, I think is the one I would be most worried about. But let's put those concerns aside for just a minute and kind of see how we might arrange to do the test. I'll talk about the test statistic in just a second. We'll do the calculation. But again, we set up the problem in such a way. So this is the statistical hypothesis. Notice the alternative is one-sided. We're looking at you know, the possibility of the alternative hypothesis that there is an improvement. Um, the null hypothesis here is that nothing has changed. The alternative is that there is an improvement. And the question is, what, what should we believe after looking at this type of evidence? So, you know, we might classify, um, so the, what the problem wants you to do in this case is to calculate the value of the test statistic in this case. So the test statistic in this case, what should it actually be? It should be some t distribution because you're dealing with means. And so the test statistic, the, the, the general formula for it in this case, will be the value of the mean that you got minus the value of mu coming from the null hypothesis divided by s over root n. So the general formula for the, for the test statistic, at least in this case, looks like this. And remember, that's t distributed with n minus one degrees of freedom. So we're going to use a t distribution in order to think about um, whether or not we think the result is extreme enough to cause us to believe that the model um, under the null is wrong or is, is in doubt somehow. So in this example, you know, how do you actually do the calculation? From the null hypothesis, we are assuming that mu under the null is, is equal to 24.5. So wherever you see mu here, you can just replace it with 24.5. Oops. Um, the realization of X bar that we get from the data, I guess looks like 25.1. And we, and we divide that by, by this guy, we're standardizing the, the value of the sample standard deviation. Looks like it's 1.26. We divide that by the square root of the sample size. That looks like it's 32. So when, when you're talking about the realization of the test statistic, the actual value you get looks like this. So what I'm going to do very quickly is, is compute what that is on Excel. Um, let me go away from this. It's just easier, I think, for me to do it that way rather than to try to do it with a calculator. So I'll open that up. Um, you can do it on a calculator if you want to. Maybe you already have. Um, so if you're, if you're trying to quickly calculate what this thing ought to be, what the value of the test statistic is, I would simply type in, let's say I need 25.1 minus 24.5 in the numerator. So 25.1 minus 24.5. I divide that by, by another fraction, 1.26 over the square root of 32, close parentheses. Um, and I get a value for the test statistic equal to about 2.69. So um, how to interpret that number? Um, you're, you're saying in the standardized sense, um, the, data, the data suggests that you know, the result is about you know, 2.7 or so um, standard errors more than, than the expected mean. Um, is that a big number? Um, you know, for most people's purposes, the answer is going to be yes. Um, so in this case, you know, we're probably prepared to think that we have evidence, you know, against the null hypothesis. Um, but we'll see how strong that evidence is in just a second. So does anyone have any questions so far? All we did in this problem is we just looked at, um, we looked at the value of the standardized statistic and reviewing that as a measurement of, um, I guess what I want to say, we're viewing that number as a measurement of the compatibility of the data with the model. Um, is, is the data that we get compatible? Is it extreme given the model? Um, the significance level will, will sort of determine whether or not we think it's too extreme. Um, but are people with me so far in this, in this discussion? It's 2.69, right? So how do we contextualize the number? That's sort of the next, that's sort of the next thing I'd like to talk about.
Now, in 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 the handout, um, I, I guess I, I guess I want to talk about it this way. In the handout, there's this discussion of the p-value. P-value has a certain definition. Um, I, I wrote it down last time. It's a complicated definition. In sort of a high-level sense, the p-value wants to measure the compatibility of the data with the model, but in a fairly concrete way. Um, from the point of view of what it really means, a p-value is the probability that you get a realization of the test statistic at least as extreme as the one that you got through the, through the survey, through the experiment. So p-value, just as, as, as an aside, p-value is the probability of a realization. By realization, I just mean a number. Of the test statistic, and these words are important, at least as extreme as what you got. Least as extreme. Um, so I'm gonna bring up StatCrunch and I'll kind of show you what I mean by that. Remember that we're talking about a T distribution. So in order to make a judgment about what that P value is, we have to use the correct probability distribution for the test statistic. What this is saying right here is that the probability distribution that we expect to use for this test statistic is T distributed with a degree of, with degrees of freedom one less than the sample size. So if the sample size is 32, we're thinking about using a test statistic uh, which, which, has a, which is T distributed with 31 degrees of freedom. Now, when you think about extreme, what do we mean by that? In the language of the statistical hypothesis, the way that we formulated it, we are looking at extreme as being the right-hand tail. Um, you're interested in whether or not there was an improvement, right? And so if we are getting, if we are getting, um, if we are getting a value for the test statistic like 2.69, we're gonna wind up thinking that, you know, that's in the right tail. How extreme is that result? How, how unusual is it? Um, we need to make a measurement and the p-value wants to do that. So let's go to stack crunch. I'll sort of talk, you know, talk you through how you might do that. Um, if you want to figure that out, go to stat, calculators. You're looking at the T distribution, so select T. Um, and you get this nice, nice, nice looking symmetric distribution right here. Degrees of freedom should be 31. Now extreme for us is 2.69 and to the right. Um, how... So anything more than 2.69 um, is more extreme than 2.69. So we wind up looking at the probability that our random variable is at least 2.69 in size in this distribution. And when we compute the p-value, we get something that's very small indeed. It's like 0 0.0057. So, you know, we can write that down. You know, so in this example, the probability, and, and I guess I need a, I guess I need a name for this. The probability that T31 is greater than or equal to 2.69 is about 0 0.0057. That's a low probability. Um, and the fact that that number is low would suggest that the result that we got through experiment is fairly extreme. The probability of getting 2.69 as a standardized value for the mean or anything more extreme than that is quite small um, if the null is true. Do you follow what I'm saying so far? If the null is true, probability of getting this result at least as extreme is not high. Yes, Lily. So what's your measure of like, what would be a high p-value versus a low p-value? Yes, that's the significance level, exactly. So when you're trying to make a judgment about what you feel like um, is high or low, you usually decide this in advance and that, that's, that's known, that is the significance level. So if the p-value falls underneath the significance level, you, 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 you believe that you have on your hands evidence against the null hypothesis. If the p-value is above the significance level, then you know, if it's greater than the significance level, then you think you do not have sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis at that significance level. So it's the significance level itself, which is deciding this for you. Does that so make sense? Did, yeah, so where did we calculate the significance level? Is that the same as what we calculated in C? Like what, where did we do that? 
So the significance level, as it turns out, it's, it's one of those things that's a little weird about this process. It's never calculated. So the, you decide on the significance level in advance. So depending on your application, you're gonna choose a different level of significance. So in this case, we're looking at maybe an alpha level equal to 0.01. It's not really something that's calculated. What's calculated in, in C, another name for a p-value is called the observed level of significance. It's what you see. Um, the significance level is just a threshold. And in a way, deciding on the significance level in advance, it's arbitrary. So we're saying, look, we're choosing a 1% significance level. What do we think? Um, and so when you're choosing a significance level, we might get into this, we might have time to get into the discussion of significance levels versus power, um, but we may not have time for that. So I might have to delay that to the last week, um, depending on where, where things stand. It's not, not really in the, it's, it's not in the, in the schedule, but it's worth talking about just to hint at, there's a trade-off between, um, you know, the alpha level and something called beta, which, which has to, it's called statistic, statistical power. Next week, when we talk a little about type one versus type two errors, the significance level ha is the probability of making something called a type one error. Power is related to something called type two error. And these are errors you can make um, when, you're, when you're thinking about the results of, of a significance test. But these things don't work together. They kind of work against each other up, up to some point. So when you're choosing a significance level, it's often very important. The truth of the matter is that when people are doing a lot of work on, you know, if they use this type of type of analysis, they usually are going to be picking a significance level for no particular reason at all. Like they're choosing a 5% significance level because historically that's what's been done. Does, does that make sense? They don't calibrate it that well, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and so when you see stuff like 0.05, like on, on an exam or on homework, when you see things like, um, or, or even when you see things like 95% confidence intervals, these things are chosen because you know people historically believed that those numbers were reasonable to, to, to use either as confidence levels or significance levels. It turns out that the relationship between significance level and something called power is important. Um, we probably won't have time to talk very much about that, but that's usually in some, some second course that you might take. Um, so you, you wanna think more, you know, if, if you look at most papers, you know, people aren't thinking about this that much. But you know, probably to be careful, you probably want to think a little bit more about the relationship between significance level and how you might arrive at a reasonable one, rather than just like, well, it's 0.01 or it's 0.05. You're just sort of choosing it. Is this good? People, people think it's all right. I guess we haven't finished the problem. Um, so what are we? What are we really saying? Um, problem is I can't remember what's in the problem anymore. But okay, so this, the observed level of significance is. 0.0057. Um, and so here, um, the, what, this, what this exercise is saying is that we should consider, we should consider a significance level equal to 0.01. And so we would note here that the p-value, the p-value that we got, you know, it's 0.0057, that's quite a bit less than 0.01. So we reject the null. Um, if you're trying to write that down um, in, in maybe a careful way, I think you can say something like this, given the evidence. So given, as I should say, given the value of the test statistic, we have statistically significant evidence against the null at a significance level alpha equal to 0 0.01. So we reject the null. We think that, um, I mean, again, you know, again, lots of ways of thinking about this, some more precise than others, but what we're basically saying is that we're, we're sort of in a situation where we feel like um, the actual experiment at, experimental evidence is not compatible with the null hypothesis. So from a practical, from a practical point of view, we would, we would say that there's evidence of an improvement. Um, one additional thing you might wanna add on F has to do with, with this business right, let me move back up, has to do with this business right here with randomness. Um, 
if you can't really um, if you can't really convince yourself that all the conditions are met, you know, there's always some you know rather tentative nature to such a conclusion. Um, you know, and there's there's also some weird language like do you have evidence in favor of the alternative? You know, a lot of this stuff, depending on what you know, how people want to oops, with how people want to write or think about it. Um, I often like to say things like you have evidence against the null, and I guess sort of symmetrically that would mean that you have evidence in favor of the alternative. Um, but you know, this is more of a matter of matter of writing taste, I think. So um, would you have evidence against the null at other levels of significance? Like if the level of significance was like one over 10,000, then the answer is no. So again, your level of significance is important. It's important about, it's important um, in determining how you feel um, about the compatibility of the data with the null, with the, with the statistical hypothesis being made. And, you know, for a lot of work that people do, it's not entirely clear where the level of significance comes from. I think in a lot of things that people do, it's, it's not really consciously chosen at all, where, you know, you have a level of significance and, you know, people are sort of carried along by some set of historical conventions where they kind of write down what these, uh, uh, what these significance levels really are. You know, based on some stuff that people have done in the past. Um, so, you know, how people feel about that, or you know, what proper you know etiquette is when you're doing this, it's changed over time. Um, I think a lot of people now, um, when they're doing this sort of work, generally prefer a p-value versus you know some sort of explicit description of how you should think about the evidence. Um, you know, I don't think that's the textbook's approach, and I think a lot of papers sort of continue to say, well, we have statistical significance. We have significant, statistically significant evidence at a certain level of significance, and they're telling you how to think about it. But the truth is that if they give you a p-value, you're, you're probably going to know how to think about it anyway. Um, p-value plus interval estimate is probably probably pretty safe to include in this type of work. Historically, that's not quite what people do, but um, you know, in any case, um, that's 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 I guess what you can look at look at doing on homework. Um, does anyone have any questions about this so far? Um, one thing I would also add, um, like with most things, you can um, should be able to subordinate some of these calculations to stat crunch. Um, if you go to stat, um, t stat, say one sample um, with summary, um, you can kind of you can kind of get it to do the work for you. So um, in this case, for example, we would think about um, you know, the, the statistical hypothesis we would be considering, I guess we would have 24 point. The problem is I can't remember. My memory is so terrible these days. I blame, I blame Zoom. Um, so, you know, we're thinking about the null hypothesis being 24.5 and the alternative mu being greater than 24.5. So we basically encode that here. Um, and, you know, the value of the sample mean, if I remember right, was 25.1. Sample standard deviation is 1.26. Sample size is 32. Um, and you can do a hypothesis test. It's a pretty general test. It's not going to tell you exactly what to do. But I think what you can see in the screen is that the p-value you get is exactly the one we computed. So um, you can get stack crunch. You can subordinate some of these calculations to stack crunch without really even knowing the value of the test statistic. Um, I think the homework assignment doesn't quite allow you to get um, to get away with that level of 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 um, you know subordinating the calculation to the software, but the ability is there. So if you if you do a calculation by hand and you find it totally unbelievable, you can get stat crunch and you, to to sort of automate the calculation and you can kind of see what um, what the result ought to be. And of course, what that would suggest is you know formulating the problem statistically and thinking about you know whether or not you're dealing with mean or proportion probably is pretty important in these types of problems. Um, so you might want to play around with that um, feature of stat crunch as you're as you're messing around with the homework. Um, I'd like to give people a chance to sort of work on some of these problems um, kind of on their own. Um, so I think as usual, I'll break people into groups. We'll have I think maybe seven groups, four or five people per group. Um, the problem that I would like people to work on um, is, is this problem two. Um, so start with two. Um, this problem, um, this prop, wait, you can't, you can't maybe see what I'm doing. Um, 
hang on, sorry. Um, this problem two right here on, um, on, the, on the handout. So this problem two will involve proportions, but you're gonna treat this problem in a similar way. Um, you're gonna be thinking about, um, you know, thinking about initially what are the hypothesis, what's the hypothesis that you're investigating. Um, you check the conditions for inference. I would point out that B, these are the same conditions if you're thinking about calculating the confidence interval for the population proportion. So just check those. Um, after you've gotten, after you've convinced yourself that the, that the normal model is reasonable, um, just sort of go through the steps, calculate the, the value of the test statistic, the realization of the test statistic under the conditions described in the problem, find the p-value and then think through the rest. Um, you know, these problems tend to take a while because there are quite a few steps, that's okay. It's about 136, we've probably got about 19, 20 minutes left in class. I'd like to have time to kind of go back and kind of formally do the problem together. Um, so what I'll do is I'll give the groups maybe 11 or 12 minutes to work on these starting now. And we will meet again at 148 and we'll finish as much of it as we can. Um, but I would like to get some input from the groups before, before, I, uh, before I step through the example. Um, so I'm about to open the rooms. We'll meet again at 148 to discuss problem two. Okay, um, so welcome back. Um, we'll get started uh, discussing, you know, sort of the tail end of the problem. Um, I hope the groups had a chance to think a little bit about what, um, or at least had, to, had a chance to make some progress on the problem. Um, you know, we'll start by sort of discussing this idea, you know, discussing what, what the statistical hypothesis would actually look like in this case. Um, there's usually some statement at, maybe at the beginning about what P represents here. So I think P represents for us the true proportion. Um, of female athletes in Olympics. And so you're looking at the rate of, of participation here. Um, so once you have a definition for P, there's this idea that there is, you know, certainly some number you're trying to estimate. Um, so if you if you think about the problem and you're trying to formulate some statistical hypothesis related to it, I think it would make sense for the null hypothesis in this case, you know, to, to be the normal no change hypothesis. Where does the 0.42 come from? It comes from right here. So it's the it's the 42 percent that that. Um, that it's the 42% that's associated to the 2004 Summer Olympic Games. So the research question, I guess, is whether or not participation for the 08 games is above that. Like, is, the, is there evidence in favor of that rather than no change at all? Um, since you're looking at whether or not there's an increase, I feel as though this is the same type of problem as the first problem. It's a one-sided test. Um, you're looking at whether or not there's an increase. That's what you're trying to investigate. Um, another thing you could potentially do, though I think it's probably not appropriate for this problem, is you could look at whether or not there was a difference um, that would result in a two-sided test, um, which oddly enough, we haven't really done a lot with so far. So before I go on, um, the people kind of see the direction that we're going in this problem. We formulated the hypothesis. We're thinking a little bit about what, um, what that ought to be, what might make sense in the context of the problem. Then we go back, we look at whether or not we think that there's enough reason to think that the sampling distribution of P hat is approximately normal. And so that's sort of the next part of the problem. Um, when we're thinking about part B, checking the conditions for inference amounts to just looking at, you know, whether or not, whether or not certain conditions are reasonably satisfied. Um, I guess what I'd like to say about that is that, I mean, first of all, I think the randomness, the randomness condition is, Um, why, why would I write that? Um, the reason why I think the randomness condition is okay is because in a way the problem is telling you that it is. Um, what's being said here is that some independent sports expert is arranging for a random sample of Olympic athletes, these pre-Olympic pre pre -Olympic exhibitions, where presumably the same athletes will go on to participate in the Olympics. And so, you know, you're, you're getting a random sample of all of these different athletes. So the randomness condition, I think you're justified in thinking that's okay. Um, you know, I do have a question. 
about 10% condition here, but that basically is out of my own ignorance of, of, of the problem. I mean, if you're dealing with 454 athletes, are you sure that 454 is less than 10% of all potential Olympic athletes in a given year? You know, I don't know. Um, there are a lot of, there are a lot of Olympic athletes, you know, you know, are there thousands? Um, so maybe there's an issue there, but you know, we could always look that up. Are people with me so far? There's a question about that. Um, finally, the success failure condition is okay. We're looking at a null hypothesis of P being equal to 0.42. Um, if you take 0.42 times 454, that's, that's the size of the sample, that's a pretty big number. Um, similarly, 0.58 times 454 is even bigger. So you can check, you can check to see that, this, that the last sort of mathematical condition, the success failure condition is Im immediately satisfied. So we, we feel like there are enough success and failures within the sample to kind of think we're all right. Um, so, you know, as we sort of proceed to the problem, I think it's reasonable to think that the sampling distribution is normal. We're probably all right. So when we calculate the test statistic here, what we're looking at is measuring the value of something that looks like this when um, we know what p hat, p, and n all are. And so we're measuring off of p equal to 0.42. So the realization of the test statistic that we're looking at is, let's, let's go back to the problem, but it's whatever um, 200 and, so it's the, it's the gap between 202 over 454, that's the sample proportion, minus the assumed value of the true proportion divided by whatever this thing is right here. So that's 0.42, um, one minus 0.42 divided by a sample size of 454. Um, now, it, again, it's easier for me to do this calculation in Excel, um, mainly because I, I feel like I can just type something in. So um, I can certainly get in, you know, I can certainly calculate the value of the sample proportion and there it is right there. Um, to calculate the value of the test statistic, you, you take that value, you subtract the assumed value for the population proportion, and you divide that by the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of p hat, which is just the square root of 0.42 times 0.58 divided by the sample size itself. We risk because I don't have enough parentheses. And when you calculate that, you get something on the order of about 1.076. So let me write that down. Now, when you've calculated just sort of a um, sort of a point here that's worth noting, if you get a if you get a value for a test statistic that's on the order of about one, um, which is kind of what this is, you you know your intuition should be at this point that that's not terribly extreme as a result. Um, we can go through and calculate the p value directly to kind of see this, but you should not. Ah. So this one question, why do we use a different equation? It's because the, it's, it's so let, me, let me see if I can finish reading the question. Okay, so it's, it's because there are, there was a question, why do we use a different equation in the first and the second problem? Why, why does the form of the test statistic change? I guess the answer to that is in the first problem we were dealing with means and in the second problem we're dealing with proportions. So it's not, um, it's, not um, it's, it's not the same, parameter that we're discussing. One parameter is, is this numerical parameter. The other parameter has to do with the count. Um, what is common to both of those accounts is that we at least know the distribution of the test statistic. So in the first problem, we feel like the test statistic is going to be T distributed with some number of degrees of freedom. In the second problem, we're going to think that the test statistic has a normal distribution with certain, with, with, uh, with standard deviation one and mean zero. So the distribution of the test statistic will change, but the reason why the formulas aren't the same is because you're not looking at the same parameters. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, you, you're, you, there was also this question about, well, look, why, what happens if you know? So um, on the first problem, remember that we don't know the population standard deviation. If we did, we could have used a normal distribution there too. Um, the, you know, of course we don't, but 
if you're ever in a position where you, you feel like you have some beliefs about the population standard deviation, you can treat the problem with a normal distribution rather than a T distribution. Um, from a practical point of view, I don't think that happens that often on the homework. So, you know, you may not want to get into a habit of that. And the truth of the matter is when a T distribution has a number of degrees of freedom, like over a hundred or something like that, it becomes very difficult to distinguish the T distribution from a normal distribution anyway. So what most people do is actually just use the normal distribution. But you know, if you have a calculator, if you have stack crunch, you might as well use, might as well use T because it's there. Um, if it were like 30 years ago and you only had like a piece of paper rather than the computer, you might be tempted to use a normal distribution just because it's easier to have one piece of paper rather than multiple pieces of paper. Um, okay. So with, with the problem, we get this test statistic, we can compute a p-value. Um, I, would, I would remind you, like if we're using this formula, this guy is normally distributed with mean zero and standard deviation one. The standardized proportion is a nice normal distribution if you know p. We're assuming p is 0.42, so we're in good shape there. So I can go back on StatCrunch to easily compute the p-value, remembering that extreme for me is anything because of the way that the statistical hypothesis is formulated, extreme is anything to the right of, of this thing right here on a standard normal distribution. So what I wanna be able to do, just like in a short picture, here's zero, here's about 1.076, extreme values fall kind of in that shaded range right there. So if anything, if, you know, so when I calculate a p-value, I want to be able to compute the probability of a realization of the test statistic, which is at least as extreme as 1.076. Um, so let me go and do that really quickly. I don't need, I could, I could do it in Excel, but let's go to StatCrunch. Um, so I go to Stat, Calculators. Now, because the test statistic is a standardized proportion, it's normally distributed. And I don't really have to do a lot of work to kind of get it, get it together here because the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. I wanna calculate the probability that my test statistic is larger than 1.076. And when I do that, I get, the, I get a p-value equal to about 0.141. So I'll write that down. So the probability that my test statistic, which is Z distributed, is greater than or equal to 1.076, it's about 0.141. That's not terribly unlikely. Um, so I guess what I guess what we're saying is that the probability of these sort of extreme a result at least as extreme as 1.07 is reasonably it's reasonably probable to get something that extreme. I guess. Um, so you know you can go on to make judgments about what that p-value really means. I guess that's what Part E is calling for you to do. If alpha is equal to 0.05, um, then you know the p-value we get you know, since it's 0.141 is, is definitely greater than 0.05. Um, so I'll sort of finish, I think, writing this down next time, but I guess sort of, oh yes, I should definitely finish because time's up, you should leave. Um, it's about two o'clock. Um, one final thing to say, p-value, not low here. And so you would actually fail to reject the null hypothesis. And I think I'll probably end with that. Um, so we'll sort of, I'll sort of write the last couple of finishing sentences down on this tomorrow. Um, 